Every time the United States announces a new armored vehicle program, the same frustrated question pops up in online forums and comment sections. Why does the Pentagon keep spending billions developing something new, only to cancel it later, instead of buying the Swedish CV-90? On paper, it seems like the obvious solution. The CV-90 is battle-proven, widely used across NATO, highly adaptable, and constantly upgraded. Yet the U.S. Army continues to pursue its own design, such as the im 2 Bradley replacement and the recently introduced M-10 Booker. The answer is complicated, tied up in politics, doctrine, economics, and the way the American defense machine works, a proven platform that many allies trust. The CV-90, or Combat Vehicle 90, was created in Sweden in the late 1980s by Haglunds and Bofors, companies now part of BAE Systems. It entered service in 1994 and has since evolved into a remarkably versatile family of vehicles. More than 1,400 are in service or on order across countries including Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, Estonia, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and now Ukraine. Nations such as Brazil, Lithuania, and Romania are actively considering it for their own armies. The CV-90's appeal comes from its flexibility. Over 17 variants exist, from standard infantry fighting vehicles to anti-tank platforms, reconnaissance vehicles, command posts, air defense systems, and mortar carriers. Modern versions like the Mark IV have a powerful 1,000 horsepower engine, advanced thermal sights, digital connectivity for drones and AI systems, and active protection against anti-tank missiles. Depending on configuration, it can carry a full infantry squad plus crew, travel at high speeds, operate in harsh climates, and even be made amphibious. Its main armament can be tailored to mission needs, with options ranging from 30 and 40 mm cannons to prototypes with 105 and 120 mm guns. This is a vehicle with a long combat resume, having seen action in Afghanistan and now in Ukraine. For many NATO armies, the CV-90 is the perfect blend of proven reliability and modern technology. So why doesn't the US adopt it instead of repeatedly trying to design new platforms from scratch? The Buy American Imperative The first and perhaps most decisive reason is that the CV-90 is not American. U.S. defense policy doesn't just encourage buying domestic, it is effectively built around it. When the Pentagon acquires a major weapon system, it is not simply buying the hardware but the entire life cycle. Parts supply, depot maintenance, training simulators, software, ammunition, and long-term upgrades. Taking on a foreign vehicle means taking on another country's supply chain and technical standards, which can create decades of logistical headaches. Congress also pushes hard for domestic production. U.S. law requires the Department of Defense to consider the health of the American defense industrial base in every major acquisition. Jobs, supply security, and political districts depend on it. Even when the military chooses a foreign design, it usually demands the production move to American soil. The FN M240 and M249 machine guns, for example, are Belgian in origin but built in South Carolina. The Beretta M9 pistol was made in Maryland. Even Israel's trophy active protection system for the Abrams tank was integrated and partly manufactured in the United States. If the Army chose the CV-90, it would almost certainly insist on building it domestically. And once that level of adaptation is required, leaders often prefer to design their own vehicle entirely. Integration isn't simple or cheap. Beyond politics, there is the challenge of making a foreign platform fit into the American military's complex digital ecosystem. The CV-90 is designed to NATO standards, but the U.S. adds layers of unique technology. Encrypted communications networks, Blue Force Tracker Battlefield Management, specialized electronic warfare and intelligence systems, and custom remote weapon stations. Retrofitting all of this onto a Swedish design would take years of engineering and testing. Every change requires new training, maintenance procedures, and spare parts pipelines. In many cases, the cost and effort to modify an existing vehicle rivals building one from the ground up. Doctrine drives the design. Another major factor is the way the U.S. develops its warfighting doctrine. 
Many nations buy a capable platform and adapt their training and tactics to it. America does the opposite. The Army builds vehicles to match how it intends to fight. U.S. armored formations are structured for combined arms maneuver, where tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, artillery, drones, and air support all feed into a massive command and control network. Each platform must fit tightly within this system, meeting specific expectations for firepower, mobility, and connectivity. That is why the Army pursued the M10 Booker, a light armored gun system intended to give infantry brigades direct fire support. The Marine Corps even explored adapting the Booker to replace its aging light armored vehicles. Had the CV-90 been American, it might have been a contender. But as a foreign product, it faced an uphill battle to prove itself not only in combat performance, but also in fitting seamlessly into a doctrine that prizes tailor-made solutions. The Defense Industry's Self-Sustaining Loop Weapons programs in the United States are not just about meeting battlefield needs. They are also about sustaining the massive defense industrial base and generating exports. In 2024, the U.S. sold more than $318 billion worth of arms abroad, a jump of nearly 30% over the previous year. Those sales help offset research costs and keep American companies alive. Importing Swedish vehicles would do nothing to feed that economic engine and might even threaten it. The procurement system has evolved to keep Congress, major defense contractors, and domestic workers satisfied. Breaking that cycle by importing a fully foreign system would be politically risky and unpopular with the very stakeholders who approve military budgets. The Bradley still gets the job done. A practical consideration also looms large. The U.S. already owns and supports thousands of M2 and M3 Bradley fighting vehicles. While the Bradley is aging and far from cutting edge, it has received steady upgrades. It now carries modern digital systems, improved armor, and a reliable powertrain. It still transports an infantry squad, fires a 25mm Bushmaster cannon alongside a coaxial machine gun, and launches Tau anti-tank missiles. Most importantly, it is backed by a mature network of mechanics, spare parts, and training. Replacing this entire ecosystem with CV-90s would mean discarding decades of investment. For Army planners, the Bradley may not be perfect, but it remains effective and fully integrated. Even in Ukraine, where troops have operated both Bradleys and CV-90s, performance has been surprisingly similar. The CV-90's 40mm cannon and higher speed are advantages, but the Bradley is praised for reliability, accurate fire control and crew survivability. There is no overwhelming battlefield case to scrap what already works. Cost and the illusion of savings The CV-90 also is not cheap. Modern versions can cost as much as $12 million per vehicle, nearly three times the price of a Bradley. It is true that U.S. research programs often spend billions before producing a single vehicle, but buying and adapting a foreign design is not a budget-friendly shortcut. Once you factor in integration costs, testing, new infrastructure, and domestic production requirements, the price difference shrinks dramatically. A changing battlefield. The Bradley and CV-90 were built for Cold War tank battles, but Ukraine is proving the battlefield has changed. Cheap drones and loitering munitions can destroy even well-armored vehicles. Both have survived some hits and saved crews, yet neither was designed for skies filled with low-cost threats. Future IFVs must start with this reality in mind. Active protection systems, low visibility to sensors, and even remote or autonomous operation. The CV-90 has added upgrades like Iron Fist APS and modern sensors, but it's still a manned 1990s design. The U.S. is betting on new programs like the XM-30 to handle these emerging dangers. And that's why the U.S. military isn't likely to buy the Swedish CV-90. Even though it's one of the best infantry fighting vehicles out there. If you found this breakdown interesting, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay curious, stay informed, and I'll see you in the next one.